Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Council Member Idenick Miller, and I'm the uh, Chair of the Committee on Civil Service and Labor. Uh, today we are here at the introduction of Intro 1313. First bill introduced to the current council was the introduction number one, an expansion of the Earned Sick Time Act passed during the last session. One of the items, one of the initial items this committee did was to consider and pass the most important bill, which increased the number of New Yorkers covered by nearly one million. To earn sick time, Act gives New Yorkers who work for employees who have more than five, em five employees to earn the ability to earn five sick days, paid sick days, or up to 40 hours. To be used for illness, to stay home, to recuperate from medical appointments, or to just take care of the health needs of family members. The bill we are hearing today, however, introduction 1313, would expand these provisions to women who need them. This bill would allow safe leaves for victims of family offenses matters, sexual offenses, stalking of themselves and their family members. Accrued time will be able to be used to seek crisis services and other legal advice and for many other reasons. It, sponsors, uh, it is sponsored by Council Member Jalissa uh, Ferreras Copeland and in conjunction with Mayor de Blasio. It would also expand the name of Earned Sick Time Act into Earned Safe and Sick Time Act so that it can be used by these victims. I'm very proud that we are hearing this important legislation that will expand upon the Council's biggest accomplishment in years. Domestic violence is a terrible problem and I'm proud and happy that this committee can do something about it to help the New Yorkers that are experiencing these crisis scenarios. I would now like to acknowledge members of the committee, the incomparable Liz Crowley, and the uh, Legislative Council, Matt Gar Carlin, and analyst Gofar Zoloff, and Mr. Gregory Rose. And um, our chief sponsor is not here, so with that, I will call the first panel. Cecil no. Mayor's Office to combat, to combat Domestic Violence, Liz Vladek, Office of Labor Policy and Standards, Lay Obet, o o -Bies. OBS, thank you, and Stephen Kelly. Okay, did I miss someone? Because we have, we're good? You can begin okay. at any end. Good afternoon, Chairperson Miller and the members of the City Council Committee on Civil Service and Labor. Um, I am Cecile Noel, Commissioner for the Mayor's Office to Combat Domestic Violence, or OCDV. I am joined uh, this afternoon by my Deputy Commissioner and General Counsel Liz Dank and Assistant Commissioner Hannah Pennington. I'm also joined by our colleagues from DCA. The Mayor's Office to Combat Domestic Violence was established in 2001 and oversees the citywide delivery of domestic violence services, creates innovative policies, develops crisis intervention and prevention-based programs, and works to increase awareness through broad and diverse outreach efforts throughout New York City. OCDV also operates the city's five family justice centers, um, FJCs, which provide comprehensive, multidisciplinary and trauma-informed services for victims of intimate partner violence, sex trafficking, and elder abuse in one location. Last year, the FJCs had over 62,000 client visits across the five boroughs. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today about this legislation that would extend the option for paid leave, safe leave, to employees who are survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, or stalking, so they may focus on safety and plan for their next steps without fearing a loss of income. And I would like to take a moment to thank 
uh, specifically Council Member Jalisa Ferreras Copeland for her support of this legislation and for her leadership in improving the safety network for survivors of domestic violence. New York City and New York State have human rights laws and the penal law that support the needs of employees to take leave from work who are survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, or stalking. These strong state and local laws, however, do not require employers to pay employees for leave to address their safety and well-being after a domestic violence, sexual assault, or stalking incident. Additionally, neither the New York City Earned Sick Time Act nor New York State's recently enacted paid leave law include provisions for employees who are survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, or stalking. Amending the NYC Earned Sick Time Act to the Earned Sick and Safe Time Act will expand the acceptable reasons to use earned sick days including paid leave where applicable, to allow a survivor of domestic violence, sexual assault, or stalking to take time off of work in order to plan for their immediate next steps and focus on safety. The Earned Sick and Safe Time Act would not add any additional days of leave available to employees, and the safe leave would only be required by employers who are, who are otherwise required to provide sick leave. The Earned Sick and Safe Time Act would enable an employee to use paid leave to restore their physical, psychological, and economic safety or well-being of, of an employee and their family or to protect those who associate or work with the employee. Acceptable paid safe leave uses would include creating a safety plan to address the immediate and ongoing safety needs of a victim and their children, or obtaining services from a victim service provider. Speaking with civil legal service providers to get information or advice on issues related to housing, family law, immigration, or other critical needs. Filing a report with law enforcement or speaking with the district attorney's office. Seeking safe housing or shelter, transferring or enrolling a child in a new school or daycare program, attending to a financial matter that may cause severe harm due to the uh, harm to the victim's financial well-being or credit standing if not immediately addressed or any other critical uh, critical action to improve or restore safety and stability. This important legislation has the opportunity to positively impact the safety and economic security of survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, or stalking. In the last 18 months, the five FJCs have served over 9,000 clients who reported being employed, and those clients accounted for over 25,000 client visits to the FJC, an average of almost three visits per client. Many of these employed clients have reported to service providers the difficulty they have in returning to the FJCs during business hours for follow-up appointments. We know that the success in obtaining legal and social services and taking measures to increase personal safety is greatly impacted by the employee's ability to take paid leave from work without facing the risk of penalty. I would like to speak for a moment about a survivor who exemplifies the need for this, for the need for this legislation. Stephanie, a client of the Manhattan Family Justice Center, worked full-time in an office. She struggled to pay her rent and keep her family financially afloat after becoming the sole income earner for her family due to domestic violence. After being assaulted by her partner, Stephanie took unpaid days off of work to speak with the assistant district attorney and meet with the case manager at the FJC. Stephanie was extremely impressed and, and Steph, Stephanie was extremely interested in other services at the FJC to help herself and her child obtain and maintain safety, but could not afford to take more unpaid time off work. The FJC worked to connect her to a few programs and organizations providing services outside of the business day 
and work to schedule phone appointments for other providers during her lunch hours. However, she had to take those calls in lunchrooms or busy hallways with, with limited ability to engage in those critical services. Stephanie, like so many other survivors of domestic violence seen at the family justice centers and community-based organizations throughout the city, demonstrated immense resourcefulness and determination connecting to services while working to provide for her family. This legislation would support survivors like Stephanie who are daily balancing their need to earn income with their need to seek assistance to increase safety and allow them to, and, and, and allow them to better connect to services for themselves and their families. This legislation has been widely supported by the members of the Mayor's Domestic Violence Task Force. In November 2016, Mayor Bill de Blasio announced the New York City Domestic Violence Task Force to develop a comprehensive citywide strategy to reduce domestic violence by intervening as early as possible, enhancing pathways to safety for survivors, and ensuring swift, effective, and lasting enforcement to hold abusers accountable. The task force was co-chaired by First Lady Shirlane McRae and Police Commissioner James O'Neill. Under the direction of myself and OCDV and Director Elizabeth Glazer, of, and, uh, and Elizabeth Glazer in the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, the task force released a comprehensive set of 27 recommendations. In April 2017, one of those recommendations was to pass this legislation to implement paid safely for survivors. The New York City Earned Sick Time Act is a national example in scope and breadth and is overseen by the largest municipal labor standards office in the country. If enacted, this legislation would continue to put New York at the forefront of extending paid leave to include domestic violence, sexual assault, and stalking survivors. Decreasing the burden on survivors of choosing between economic stability and meeting their safety needs. We thank you for the opportunity to speak on this issue and welcome any questions that the committee may have. Good afternoon, Chairman Miller and members of the committee. <clears throat> I'm Liz Vladek, Deputy Commissioner of the Office of Labor Policy and Standards at the Department of Consumer Affairs. On behalf of DCA Commissioner Salas, and I am very glad to help represent the administration at today's hearing with my colleagues from the Office to Combat Domestic Violence, um, and to discuss securing important workplace protections for survivors of family violence and their loves, loved ones by amending one of the mayor's signature initiatives, the Earned Sick Time Act. I am joined by my colleagues from OLPS, Leah Obias, our Director of Stakeholder Engagement, and Stephen Kelly, our Associate Commissioner. Our mayor, the speaker, and all of you have shown great leadership in supporting laws and policies for workers in New York City, particularly the most vulnerable among them, to have the support they need to take care of themselves and their families. As you know, DCA works to protect and enhance the daily economic lives of New Yorkers. The administration and the council created DCA's Office of Labor Policy and Standards to be a dedicated voice in city government for workers in New York City and to improve the working conditions of women, people of color, immigrants, refugees, and other vulnerable workers. Amending the Earned Sick Time Act will build on the protections the law affords workers and the success it has already achieved in the three short years since implementation. New York City was the seventh jurisdiction to enact paid, safe, paid sick leave protections for workers when our law took effect in 2014. And we've been joined since then by more than 30 other cities, counties, and states across the country in ensuring that workers can take time off to tend to their, themselves and their family members' need for sick time. As Commissioner Noel pointed out, um, we are the largest municipal labor standards in the office in the country, and our paid sick leave law has the broadest coverage of any such law, protecting the legal right to sick leave for millions of private and non and nonprofit sector worker workers. 
Since 2014, OLPS has closed almost 1,000 paid sick leave investigations, securing more than $5.4 million in fines and restitution for more than 17,000 workers in New York City who were denied their right to paid sick leave, and we have ensured that thousands more workers receive sick leave to which they're entitled. Our cases come most commonly from lower wage professions, such as security guards, home health aides, restaurant workers, and retail workers, and these results demonstrate our our deep and unwavering commitment to aggressively enforcing this law. But the Earned Sick Time Act has also proven to protect New York City workers without harming business. The City Economic Development Corporation announced earlier this year that citywide unemployment has dropped to the lowest rate since 1976, which is when the earliest available unemployment data from the State Department of Labor is available. The city has added more than 325,000 new jobs since Mayor de Blasio took office, and research by the Murphy Institute and Center for Economic and Policy Research has shown that the Earned Sick Time Act has not negatively impacted businesses. According to a report titled No Big Deal, the overwhelming majority of employers surveyed, more than 85%, reported that the law did not increase costs, while more than 94% reported that the Earned Sick Time Act had no effect on productivity, and 2% even reported productivity increased. Similarly, 96% of employers reported no change in customer service as a result of the new law, and more than 3% saw an increase with less than 1% reporting a decrease in customer service. Virtually no employers reported any change in turnover. The amendments under consideration by the council um, would mark the latest step in New York City's leadership in adopting and enforcing a new generation of minimum labor standards, in this case to ensure robust protections for workers who face threats to their lives and their livelihood. I want to introduce a couple of my colleagues today. I wanted you to see how our office approaches this work and how we understand what our new obligations would be under this law. So first I'll introduce Leah Obias, who is our Director of Stakeholder Engagement. I've asked Leah to speak about their experience providing assistance to survivors of family offense matters. Um, because I want the public to understand that our office has the expertise to work carefully and thoughtfully with workers in difficult situations who need a special kind of attention and support. After Leah speaks, I'll ask my Associate Commissioner Stephen Kelly to quickly provide a little more information about exactly what the new legislation would do. Leah. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner Vladek, Chairman Miller and members of the committee. Prior to joining OLPS, I spent over a decade as a community organizer with Damayan Migrant Workers Association, a community-based organization and worker center here in New York City. At Damayan, I worked with immigrant women workers from the Philippines who were mostly nannies, elderly caregivers, and house cleaners. They came to us with stories of exploitation and verbal, emotional, and sometimes physical abuse. The economic pressure facing immigrant women working in precarious industries like domestic work cannot be overstated. Because of poverty and lack of, unemployment, and lack of employment opportunities in their home countries, immigrant women workers make the ultimate sacrifice to leave their families and their entire support networks behind and come here to work. They do, they do so through illness, through crises, and through all the emotional and psychological effects of often multiple forms of trauma. The simple prospect of taking a day off would elicit a shrug I've seen too many women do, along with the simple response, no work, no pay. One such worker I'll call Clara. Clara came to Damayan when she was working as a nanny in Tribeca. She had met a man I'll call Stuart through an online dating site and they became serious pretty quickly. But Clara started to become suspicious when the details of Stuart's life story were inconsistent in particular his occupation. Clara discovered that Stewart was actually a law enforcement officer. When she confronted him and tried to call off their engagement, he became incensed. He threatened her with deportation if she would not marry him. He began to track her movements and send her threatening texts and emails about the fact that he knew where she worked and where she lived. When Clara came to Damayan for help, she was in the middle of this nightmare. We connected her immediately with an attorney at the New York Legal Assistance Group, who set up appointments with two district attorney's offices, 
while I spoke with Clara about her work situation. She had a good relationship with her employer and was lucky, she told me. She had informed her employer about what was going on and her employer was supportive. We also set Clara up with a counselor at Safe Horizon. She continued to meet with her attorneys who were exploring a potential U visa application. We went to a health clinic and to those assistant district attorneys. Each appointment was another negotiation with her employer. At one point she told me she was worried that she was asking for too much. Clara did eventually get through this crisis and stayed in touch with Damayan as a member. Some details of Clara's story are extraordinary, which is why I remember it so vividly. Some details are not. Women survivors of violence are constantly making calculations about how to ensure their safety, whether at work, at home, or in the streets. Clara had an understanding and a fair employer. Many workers do not. Economic pressure forces women to make the untenable choice between their safety and well-being and the ability to provide for their families. No woman and no person should have to make that choice. The new policies represented by this legislation would help ensure that they do not have to. Stephen Kelly, the Associate Commissioner of OLPS, will now speak in more detail about how these amendments will secure vitally important workplace protections for survivors of family violence and their loved ones. Thank you. Before Mr. Kelly, we've been joined by Council Members Cornegy, Drum, and Kostanidis. Thank you, Director OBS, Deputy Commissioner Vladek, Commissioner Noel, Chairman Miller, and members of the committee. Director OBS's testimony confirms that many workers need time off to care for themselves or their loved ones after surviving domestic violence, sexual assault, and stalking. Without paid time off, survivors may lose their jobs at the time they most need to ensure their own safety and that of their children or other loved ones. When presented with the challenges of dealing with these incredibly difficult life events, no worker should have to forego a potentially life-saving precaution, like obtaining an order of protection, because they cannot afford to take time off work. Allowing workers to address urgent safety needs when they arise without fear of job loss helps to ensure that they can address the most pressing needs facing themselves and their family, but can also continue to provide for themselves and their family. There are a number of notable features of the Earn Sick and Save Time Act that reflect the city's recognition that this issue is critically important and set forth the broadest possible legislative measures to address this crisis. Most, exi most existing safe leave legislation provides time off for workers to deal with issues solely related to physical violence. This bill permits leave for family offense matters defined to include any act or threat of an offense over which the New York State Family and Criminal Courts have concurrent jurisdiction. This ensures that victims of physical abuse, such as assault, emotional abuse, such as harassment and menacing, and economic abuse, such as identity theft, are all protected by the legislation. The bill also expands the definition of family member beyond legal and blood relatives by including relationships that are just as strong and important as those traditional categories. This includes any individual whose close association with the worker is the equivalent of a family relationship. Thus, the amended definition of family member would ensure that those who rely on a chosen family beyond blood relations, including members of the LGBTQ community, can avail themselves of safely protections. Under the existing law, an employer may not require the employee to disclose the reason for needing to use accrued leave and may only request documentation after an absence of more than three consecutive workdays. This will continue to be the case for safe leave, and documentation to be provided when it is used will not be required to disclose any specific details of the family offense matter, sexual offense, or stalking. Finally, the legislation protects the survivor's privacy in the workplace. All information concerning the employee's status or perceived status as a victim shall be confidential and may not be disclosed without the employee's written permission or as otherwise required by law. At OLPS, we remain sharply focused on our mission to enforce key workplace laws and rules, to educate workers, employers, and the public about workplace protections under local, state, and federal law, 
and to research and advance policy initiatives that raise the floor for workers and respond to a changing economy. Empowering the workers protected by this legislation is part of that mission. We thank the Council for your partnership with the administration on the many workplace issues that impact so many New Yorkers. We look forward to engaging further with the Council and other stakeholders on the important proposals being discussed today. Thank you, and we are happy to take any questions that you may have. Okay, thank you. So, um, obviously, uh, we, we've, in your testimony, discussed a, a full range of, of the impact of domestic violence on his victim and sexual assault on his on his victims. I'd like to kind of drill down on that and 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 um, see where it's gotten us to the legislation today and what the legislation's intent are and whether or not it's going to be sufficient in its execution. Um, obviously, um, we've looked at paid sick leave, Family Medical Leave Act, and things like that, and often they fall short, uh, which is great that we're having this hearing in advance so that we know that the provisions that are being put forth are the ones that are going to uh, satisfy the intent. So, um, Tell us about the communities that, that are most impacted by domestic violence and sexual assault here within the city of New York. What do the de demographics look like? Domestic violence, as we know, crosses all ethnic, socioeconomic lines, um, uh, sexual orientation. Domestic violence can be in any family and any community. I. Um, of course, we know that issues of poverty disproportionately impact many things, not just domestic violence. Um, so that we often see uh, folks who are who are from communities that are um, less uh, less um, that have fewer economic resources often come to government and other sources for help, but. Um, we know that domestic violence crosses all of those lines. Um, so in the city, um, as we said before, our family justice centers uh, last year, or, 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 or last year, the police department had over 81,000 uh, um, intimate partner violence reports. Um. What a number, or you don't have to give me an exact number. Uh, is there a percentage of uh, male victims involved here? This know? includes um, our numbers, uh, or the number that I just gave you does not necessarily break out male victims, but we know that males are also impacted by domestic violence equally, as well as LGBTQ survivors um, are also impacted. Immigrants. What what are some of the hardships faced by the victims of domestic violence in in terms of uh, um, their workplace situation? As to, and, and I know that there was some mention in the testimony about some of the obligations that come along with trying to uh, um, move forward in their lives, whether it's through the courts or receiving other types of counseling and so forth. Um, what, what are the impact on that, um, on those victims? What does it look like in terms of, uh, have you identified what, what, what the cost of lost time is from both sides, from, from the victim's perspective? And then obviously, uh, um, as I see that there is, uh, there is some opposition to the legislation that was here as well. So uh, in terms of lost time and the impact on the employer, but for, for the purposes of what we're talking about at this time, uh, that would be for the, the victims of domestic violence and, and sexual assault. W what is the impact, this economic impact specifically okay. that you've seen? So what I would like to do is talk about 
the uh, survivor or victim, and then I would like DC to maybe talk about the employer and, and, and that aspect. So when we uh, talk about survivors or victims of uh, domestic violence, sexual assault, or stalking, this is a devastating issue in their life. And in order to address it in many ways, as, as we discussed in the testimony, it's not just physical abuse, it's emotional, it's financial, it's many things. And, and, and addressing that can and does often involve multiple systems, multiple appointments. And so uh, a, a survivor who is also employed will need to take time off work, leave work to make appointments, leave work to meet with a district attorney or, or, or meet with a lawyer, go into shelter, all kinds of things that impact their ability to, one, maintain stable employment, and two, and if they can do that, it can also affect their, even though employed, their ability to be paid for the days that they are taking off because they are pursuing all of these issues. So in terms of the employer? Um, so I think it's sort of a truism in our work that where there's not regulation of a specific issue, it's often hard to get really good data about how that issue is playing out. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm not aware of good data that really tell us the exact economic impact of domestic violence on employers. But I think we know some basic common sense realities, right? We know that as Leah was describing, when a survivor is in a position where they've got to get out of their house, they've got to pull their kid out of school, they've got to show up for an appointment with an attorney or a social worker, they're making a really hard choice and a really hard calculation. And they're either, if they don't have a generous employer or an employer who's going to work with them, they're making a choice between blowing off those important safety needs or possibly losing their job. Um, and so we then go back to, well, what does it mean for an employer every time they lose an otherwise productive employee, right? They've got to get hire someone new. They've got to train them up. That has major productivity implications. Similarly, for someone who's in a crisis situation and may have trouble getting their work done, showing up on time because of everything they're trying to juggle, these are productivity issues. Um, and so what the No Big Deal report that I referred to earlier looks at and other research that's starting to be done with the new paid sick leave laws um, is that actually when the workforce is healthy um, and they're able to manage the other demands in their life, they're generally more productive. When they think their employer has more of an investment in them, um, they're more productive. So while you know, I can't give you the numbers I wish I could, um, we think this will have positive economic impact. So um, it's, it, and, and again, just, I'm, I'm not even playing devil's advocate. We're just putting it out here, making sure that, we're, that we are actually doing as much as we possibly can here, that we're covering all our bases here. So, um, and so the question that was asked previously about um, have we been able to calculate lost time was, was do we, w w was, to kind of preference whether or not we were calculating uh, the proper, um, whether or not the five days on the current provision was sufficient in the amount of time based on the lost time that we've seen, um, probably not. Um, but I, you know, I, I understand that we're not, um, that we want to amend something that already exists and that has worked well and that provision calls for those five days to be, or 40 hours to be accrued. Uh, how, how would we address that beyond that? So I know that, and also, um, Family Medical Leave Act, that there are certainly, you know, 60 hours, and, and, and how does that look? And, and employers have a lot of leeway, and in the current Washington environment, the employ, empl I'm sorry, employers have a lot of leeway in that and what we currently see coming out of Washington are a tightening of that and, and employees having difficulty in being able to exercise their right to utilize that. Are we doing enough to protect workers in this particular case to ensure that what we put here is going to be not just sufficient, but they're going to be able to, to, to exercise their right to use that? Well, um, you know, something else that this No Big Deal report actually looked at was the level of employer support for the policy now that it, that it had been implemented and they'd, have to, they'd had to, they're having to live with it. 
And that's a useful statistic, too, because it turns out employers generally favor the Earned Sick Time Act, right? And I, I say that in response to your question to say, I think, you know, some workers will never need five days. Some workers will never need a single day. I know some people who have perfect attendance records, mm -hmm. right? Some workers will need a lot more than five days, mm -hmm. right? And it's going to be a case-by-case -case thing. But really the first step and the critical thing we have to do is shift the culture of expectations, that it's a right to take a day off when you need it for your family, mm -hmm. for your health, for your um, your children or your parents, and not a privilege. And I think that shift is something we're starting to see, and it's it sort of then helps us get to the question of when workers need more or less. Okay. Um, Council Member Drum? Just one question. Uh, I think that the way the legislation is written, uh, it says that after three days, they'd have to bring proof of um, the situation. So um, if I'm a, am I correct on that? After three consecutive work days, then the employee, or the employer rather, may request that the employee bring in some type of documentation. And what would that documentation include? The legislation as written provides a, a variety of acceptable and reasonable documentation. It could be a letter written by the, the service organization to whom the, the worker or the family member consulted with, an attorney, it could be a police report, it could be a correspondence from the court, but what it can also be is a notarized letter from the worker, him or herself, that simply identifies that the leave used was for safe leave purposes. Does um, extending the law in any way prohibit other types of excuses for absence from work? In other words, since we're listing everything at this point, I'm not an attorney, but I was told at one time that when you begin to list things, that then those are the only reasons that you're allowed. I, th I think the council's been clear on the legislative purpose first of sick leave, paid sick leave, and now of paid safe leave. Um, and so I don't think there's been an intent to cover the universe. Um, therefore, I, I think the legislative process has been very thoughtful, especially now that we've had a few years to implement, to ensure that the intent of what we're covering is really what's represented by the law and the legislation. I mean, I'm very supportive of the legislation. I just wonder why sometimes employers are so hesitant to give their employees time off for whatever it needs to be done in their own personal life to get their lives together and why we have to even begin to just list excuses. I think this goes back to um, my comment earlier. There's sort of a, you know, devil you know is better than the devil you don't know. And so when we're telling employers now these are these new policies you're going to have to implement, you know, what we saw before earned sick leave was implemented was a fear that there would be abuse. Mm -hmm. That was frequently cited as a basis for opposition to the law. And again, this report, no big deal, it says, well, that hasn't come to pass. Mm -hmm. So I really ascribe it to that. Thank you. So w would this in any shape, form, or fashion require the employer to extend the paid sick uh, and safe uh, provisions beyond five days, so it would have no impact on the previous. No, it would be so. The their, employer their contribution would be the same. Correct. The employer would look at a, an employee's accruals and say, "Up oh, forty hours. I'm sorry, you have no more paid leave available." Councilmember Cornegie. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> So I just want to say that I'm uh, framing the context for my questions out of the fact that I chair the Committee on Small Business. Um, and although I support the legislation wholeheartedly, I do represent a constituency that consists of small and micro businesses. Mm -hmm. right, so when we think of small business, sometimes we think of the major retail outlets, uh, which it will na remain nameless for this conversation, but the larger ones who uh, have the latitude and the capacity to absorb legislation as it rolls out. I also represent, like I said, uh, smaller mom and pops and micro businesses who find it incredibly difficult on a daily basis uh, to continue uh, to work with the staffing patterns that they have, usually five and under, including themselves as the employee. Um, I, uh, so, and those small and micro businesses uh, generally want to do the right thing and understand that support for their respective employees is actually good business. 
I just wanted to know if the, the panel thought that we could arrive at the expected or intended outcomes of the legislation, maybe through education and incentives as opposed to uh, legislation. So um, as you know, our agency is very committed to working closely with small business and to conducting extensive education. The entire first year after the effective date of paid sick leave, we did not do enforcement, we did education. Um, and we very strongly believe in that model. What we've seen, especially now that we're a few years in with implementation, is that our first round of enforcement suggested that you know, our education was penetrating, but we had to go a little deeper and go a little farther. We had to sort of cover the terrain we didn't cover in initially or that cover it again. Um, in other words, we had cases where the issue was employers' understanding of the law. And once we were able to get employers up to speed and understand it, we resolved those cases. As we're farther along, we're now seeing employers who frankly, and to be frank, they're larger employers, um, but we're seeing employers who are saying, yeah, I get that this is what you're telling me the law is, but I, I don't want to go along with it. Um, and so we're trying to, to be able to strike that balance, right? We think that um, we need to have the enforcement resource to really ensure we are guaranteeing those rights. Um, but I can tell you we have a rubric for negotiating resolutions to our cases. And when we have an employer that stepped in it by accident, we negotiate down for that settlement, right? But we have found that we've got to have that enforcement tool for those employers who would prefer not to comply if they don't have to. So, so thank you for your answer, and I look forward to continuing to work with you uh, in and around issues that are germane to small and micro businesses in the city of New York. Thank you. So I, I, I'd like to thank the panel for, for, for the effort that they put and putting together this really common sense legislation here that I know is not easy and that there's always opposition out there. And, um, and but it, in order for us to come to the consensus that we put uh, people first, but also uh, the, a consensus around um, how do we do that and, and, and still be able to provide services um, to, to everyone uh, at large is, is important and I know it is not easy. Uh, this is something that the council grappled over um, for a few months now and um, that we've gotten here today and I think that I happen to think that this is uh, the legislation is going to certainly provide what we intended it to provide and that is uh, an opportunity for those victims to uh, take care of themselves and their, their families in a way that they're not making other sacrifices and and while we're not reinventing the world, that just adding a provision to paid sick is uh, certainly, uh, I think, the consensus as to how it should get done. So I, I thank you for your efforts and your expertise. And we'll call the next panel. A better balance, Molly Weston Williamson, James Megler, Safe Horizons, and Rachel Brandenstein? Bronson? Okay. Her justice.
Thank you. My name is Molly Weston Williamson, and I am a staff attorney with A Better Balance, a national legal nonprofit based in New York City that champions the ability of working people to care for themselves and their families without compromising their economic security. We are proud to have helped write, fight for, and win the landmark New York City Earned Sick Time Act and have represented workers under the law since it went into effect. We continue to work on enacting paid sick and safe time around the country. Today, we are delighted to support expanding this crucial law. Since 2014, the Earned Sick Time Act has given workers in New York City the right to earn time off, usually paid, that they can use when they or their families are sick, injured, or receiving medical attention, including mental health and preventive care. Survivors of domestic violence, sexual abuse, and stalking already have the right to use their earned sick time to address their physical and mental health needs, along with those of their families as a result of these heinous crimes. Survivors, especially low-income workers, also need and deserve the security of knowing they can take the time they need to get assistance or get to safety without risking their paycheck at a vulnerable time. The proposed legislation would expand the existing law by allowing survivors to use their earned time for non-medical needs, a practice commonly known as safe time. These needs could include meeting with an attorney or social services agency, relocating or planning to relocate for safety reasons, interacting with law enforcement or the district attorney's office, enrolling a child in a new school, or other actions to ensure their family's health and safety. A majority of jurisdictions with sick time laws on the books, including all seven statewide laws, already include safe time protections. Laws passed more recently have almost universally included safe time, and San Francisco, which enacted the first sick time law in the country, has since amended it to include safe time. It is time for New York City to join them. We applaud the council and the mayor, as well as the many other sponsors and champions for advancing this crucial and common sense measure. We are equally excited to support another important aspect of this bill. Intro 1313 would expand the definition of family member under the law to better reflect and protect the diversity of our families. This would ensure that workers can care for all the people who are most important to them when they are sick or suffering, including workers' extended families and chosen families, loved ones to whom they may not have a legal or biological relationship. In enshrining workers' right to care for their chosen families, New York City would join Los Angeles, Chicago and Cook County, Illinois, St. Paul, Minnesota, and the state of Arizona. It is particularly fitting for New York to take this important step in the month of June, because chosen families are especially important for LGBTQ New Yorkers. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. We are proud to support Intro 1313 and urge you to support this important bill. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today on the proposed legislation to allow victims of family offense matters, sexual offenses, and stalking to use paid safe leave time. My name is James Marr, and I'm the director of the Dove Initiative at Safe Horizon, the nation's leading victim assistance organization and New York City's largest provider of services to victims of crime. Safe Horizon's mission is to provide support prevent violence, and promote justice for victims of crime and abuse, their families, and communities. We have programs across all five boroughs in the city's family courts, criminal courts, domestic violence shelters, police precincts, and community offices. And we meet with victims each day who will benefit from this law if passed. Safe Horizon thanks Council Member Julissa Ferreras Copeland for sponsoring this legislation and for supporting the work of Safe Horizon for many years. We also thank Mayor Bill de Blasio for assembling the New York City Domestic Violence Task Force in 2016. Safe Horizon is grateful and pleased to have been included at the table during this process, and we look forward to working with our government and community partners in following through on the task force's recommendations and continuing to enhance New York City's response to domestic violence. Passing this law, paid safe leave, is one of the many recommendations put forward by that task force. Although there are countless hardships facing victims of domestic violence, sexual violence, and stalking, my comments today will focus on the economic obstacles that victims encounter when seeking assistance and the impact this legislation will have on our clients. It is important to begin by saying that victims of domestic violence, sexual violence, and stalking encounter many systems when seeking support and safety. Family court, criminal court, shelters, hospitals, community programs, and many more. Each of these systems can be confusing and overwhelming, especially to people in crisis. For the sake of time, I will focus on family court. My colleagues and I have met with many survivors who were encouraged to seek relief from family court. They arrived in the morning, believing that they would be able to quickly obtain an order of protection and move on with the rest of their day. 
Unfortunately, the process for obtaining an order of protection or other forms of relief through family court can be very long. A victim may wait all day before their hearing and the case may be adjourned for a later date. And this can happen again and again for months or even years. Many victims, after obtaining accurate information about the court process, tell us that this was their one day, their one chance to take off from work and seek the help and support they were looking for. One colleague met with a survivor who had petitioned for an order of protection, child support, and custody the prior year. During that year, the client's abusive partner rarely showed up for court, so all three cases were adjourned from month to month. She did not get paid when she was not working, and she had to take the full day off for each court appearance because there is no designated hearing appointment. Her time in court took a huge financial toll on her and her children. Safe Horizon helped her with gift cards and metro cards to ease some of the financial burden, but a full day's pay would have been much more useful and valuable. Another client who recently sought assistance. Sure, 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 sure. Um, the sad fact is that there are only, these are only the stories of the victims who are able to seek our support and share them with us in the first place. Um, enduring all of these many systems um, requires time and an incredible amount of physical and mental energy. This legislation is definitely a step in the right direction in allowing people to gain the access that, to the services they need. I wanna thank the city council and the, oops, not on, thank you. I want to say, thank the City Council and the Committee on Civil Service and Labor for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Rachel Bronstein. I'm the managing attorney, policy attorney of Her Justice, a nonprofit organization that takes a pro bono first approach to the provision of legal services to low income women with high stakes legal needs in New York City. Approximately 80% of our clients are domestic violence survivors. All are facing barriers to their ability to thrive that the law can address. Our staff of 18 lawyers and legal assistants ensures that over 3,000 women each year receive assistance in family, divorce, and immigration ma matters. Based on our experience representing thousands of victims of domestic violence in civil court, we strongly support intro number 1313 and encourage an amendment that reflects how essential civil court access is for victims of domestic violence. The effects of domestic violence in a victim's life are pervasive. For many, fleeing domestic violence may be the first time they come into contact with the legal system to directly address the violence they have suffered. It is less well known that domestic violence survivors need to access the civil courts for other kinds of relief as well. Child and spousal support orders from family court, orders of custody and rights to a fair share of marital assets in a Supreme Court divorce. As you are well aware, the current reality of charged language and changing federal policy has created a dreadful climate of fear among families who have any foreign born members. We are working hard to ensure that civil court is a safe place for our immigrant clients to access remedies crucial to their well-being. Legal services are essential but not sufficient. While, also, while our services are free, our clients cannot get safe or meaningfully participate in their cases with us if they do not have a job or sufficient income. Domestic violence survivors often face particular challenges in maintaining employment. For example, one client I will call Maria was fired from her job as a secretary after she missed three days of work to attend court hearings in her custody case against her abusive ex-partner who repeatedly called her workplace during the litigation. Maria ultimately resor resorted to government assistance to make ends meet. Another Her Justice client I will call Sophie had to go to court six times in a child support case against her abusive ex-partner, losing wages each day she missed work. When her employer began complaining about her missing work, Sophie decided to withdraw the case. Within two months, Sophie and her child moved to a homeless shelter and applied for public assistance. Paid safe leave laws, such as intro number 13, 13, will further strengthen existing protections in New York City for domestic violence victims in the workplace. We fully support the proposed legislation and applaud the council for recognizing the need for it. We believe the legislation could go even further to allow domestic violence victims to participate in civil court proceedings without fear of losing their jobs. Intro number 1313 could be strengthened to allow victims to use safe time to prepare for or participate in any criminal or civil proceeding, including the matters enumerated in the proposed legislation, in addition to meeting with a civil attorney or other social service provider to obtain information and advice. Thank you. So let me just say, I don't have any questions, but I, I, I do, because I think you answered them, that, that your voice is accurately um, articulated, the, the need for safe time, and, and really, it, you know, because 
Um, I have a lot of background experience in, in FMLA and, and, and paid sick and, and looking at those provisions as to whether or not they were covering um, the, our intended target audience. And, and certainly this is a different audience here with different needs and, and you really have expressed that well. So I want to thank you for your advocacy first off and for being here today. It's, it's really important that we be able to get this message out and that we be able to get it right this time around. So thank you so much. And uh, final panel. Okay. Yes. Sarah Hayes, Sanctuary for Families, and Mora. Mora. McCarthy. McCarthy. Is that close? Yep. Wow. I got it. There you go. <laughs> May begin. Good afternoon. My name is Sarah E. Hayes, and I'm Deputy Director of the Economic Empowerment Program at Sanctuary for Families. Sanctuary is New York State's largest provider of comprehensive services exclusively for survivors of domestic violence and trafficking. We're so grateful to the New York City Council, Chairman Miller, and other members of the committee for the opportunity to testify today. And to Council Member Ferreras Copeland and Mayor de Blasio for introducing this urgently needed paid safe leave bill before the Council. As we know all too well at Sanctuary, domestic violence is a public health crisis that causes devastation for victims not just at home, but in all aspects of their lives, including the workplace. Nationally, victims of intimate partner violence lose millions of work days each year, and between one quarter and one half of domestic violence victims report that they have lost a job due at least in part to the violence. Beyond just days when victims are unable to work due to physical injury or hospital visits, lost work hours and days can result from abuse even after victims leave their abusers. Victims may have court appearances and legal appointments, shelter and housing related appointments. This is why the paid safe leave legislation is so important. Abuse survivors need to know that they can take time off from work to attend to these needs without fear of lost wages or termination. As the mayor has said, in the 21st century in the greatest city on earth, those who have already suffered at the hand of those they love should never have to choose between their safety, a paycheck, or their home. At Sanctuary, we've seen all too many cases of clients who have lost jobs due to domestic violence. In my work with the Economic Empowerment Program over the past five years, I see these issues each day, working with over 150 women annually as they strive to get back on their feet and secure living wage jobs in the wake of violence. Some have not worked for months or even years due to the trauma of domestic violence, and consequently, they face gaps on their resume that we help repair with portable skills and internships. We will continue to offer this high-quality training to prepare women for the living wage workforce, but the fact is that these survivors shouldn't face these situations in the first place. Consider the case of Julia, who was gainfully employed until, finally realizing that her partner's violence had become too dangerous, she fled to a domestic violence shelter to seek safety for herself and her children. But going into shelter, filing for an order of protection, and related court and legal appointments meant days of work missed. Without a provision of paid leave allowing her to address domestic violence related issues, she had no legal claim on the legitimacy of missed work days, which ultimately resulted in her unemployment. Her lost income then translated to a financial burden shifted to the city in the form of public assistance and other social safety net entitlements. New York City has a strong track record of progressive legislation and policies to ensure that the support, to ensure domestic violence victims and their families have the support that they need to get to safety and to survive and thrive in the wake of violence. This new legislation is a logical next step after the paid sick leave legislation of 2014. And thank you for the opportunity to testify today and thank you for your work on behalf of our community's most vulnerable abuse survivors. Chair Miller, Council, and staff, good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity to address the Council on Intro 1313, Safe Leave for Victims of Family Offenses, Sexual Offenses, and Stalking. My name is Maura McCarthy and I am a staff attorney with the Matrimonial and Family Law Unit at the New York Legal Assistance Group. 
NILAG is a nonprofit law office dedicated to providing free legal services and civil legal matters to low income New Yorkers. The Matrimonial and Family Law Unit prioritizes survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault. Additionally, survivors of domestic violence, sex assault, and stalking seek services at NILAG for other civil matters, very often correlating to their status as survivors. For example, transferring housing or HRA benefits, foreclosure defense, and consumer protection issues. NILAG strongly supports the Safe Leave Bill. We are all aware that domestic violence and similar offenses have an enormous economic impact not only on survivors but at, as to society as a whole. Social science research supports that proposition. It is reported that as many as 25% of survivors have reported a job loss as a direct result of domestic violence. One study found that 91% of survivors had resigned or lost a job in the last year as a direct result of violence at home. It is estimated that survivors lose a total of 8 million days of paid work each year. The economic impact of domestic violence on society as a whole is staggering with an estimated cost exceeding $8.3 billion per year. New York City alone fields 800 domestic violence related calls to the NYPD each day. Anecdotally, as a lawyer for domestic violence, sexual assault, and stalking survivors, we can attest to the economic damage that domestic violence causes survivors and their families. We have seen firsthand that survivors often choose to withdraw from, a, from proceedings requesting orders of protection due to fears of job loss related to repeated court appearances. We have seen survivors enter into settlement agreements simply because they can no longer afford the economic toll of missed work, missed wages, and the inability to abstain to obtain stable employment. We have seen survivors refuse to cooperate with criminal investigations and protections because they fear that such proceedings will cause them to miss work and ultimately lose their jobs. We have seen survivors have to choose between taking time to seek safe shelter and taking time to seek an order of protection. This bill protects such survivors by allowing them the time they need to secure safe housing, orders of protection, counseling, and other services. Additionally, this bill destigmatizes survivors by acknowledging that a large portion of the population is impacted by domestic violence, sexual assault, and stalking. As such, NILAG strongly supports this bill and urges City Council to pass Intro 1313. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. And thank you, ladies. Uh, again, as I said to the last panel, you really shine some light on this very, very unfortunate uh, occurrences and, and these victims and put some faces to, and, and names to the victims as well. And um, as a member of the council, I'm, I, I'm to, to one degree, I'm disappointed that we even have to hold this hearing because of the, the nature of it. Um, but I'm encouraged by the, the, the uh, the mosaic of communities that have come together to support these victims. And unfortunately, uh, we have gone beyond education that we have to uh, now le legislate and uh, because un uh, employers have not uh, on their own felt it necessary to support these victims. And so um, I'm, I'm sure after this we will be voting soon and this, this will, uh, legislation will now uh, amend the now uh, paid sick leave, and um, that the victims will have the protections that they need. So I thank you again for your advocacy and look forward to continuing to work with you. So you. with that, is that it? That's it. We will call the hearing adjourned. And thank you for everyone that came out this afternoon. Your attendance and support was very support. Uh, uh, support was very important as well. And um, we have a little more work to be done, so continue to reach out to other members and ensure that they're supporting the legislation and that um, we are voting yes. So thank you so much for coming out. Here is now adjourned. 622. 222. Two, two. You're too young to remember that.